Hello, and welcome to the If We Knew Then podcast. I'm Stephen Sox. And I'm Lori Sox. And today we're joined by documentarian Ted Green. And we're talking about Ted's newest film, The Best We've Got, The Carl Erskine Story. What an honor to watch this film. It's something we feel that everybody needs to watch. It's a story about a man who, through making love and kindness as natural as breath, quietly, and with grace, has changed the world. Carl Erskine is a legendary Brooklyn Dodger, L.A. Dodger pitcher, teammate of Jackie Robinson, father of Jimmy, who has Down syndrome, and early pioneer with a Special Olympics organization. Carl's life is the framework of what I've always suspected possible, that through love... That's when we are our best. That's when we make the most difference. And that's really when life matters. That's really when we're in the good stuff. His impact on the Down syndrome community is revolutionary. His wife Betty's decision to keep and raise their son Jimmy at the time, and even now we can look back at as nothing shy of courageousness, nothing shy of the ultimate courage. When society is telling you the opposite with full force to stand against that and to follow your heart. And it is, it is, a, it is about a world whose heart has been carved out and finding a way back to our heart, finding a way back to making the changes come from loving each other, from just love. It's such a beautiful story. It's set on the backdrop of Carl living the American dream, a professional athlete in the time when professional athleticism was really the pinnacle of what it meant to be successful. Carl and Betty's story show us what real success is. Lives that embody the quote on Carl's friend Jackie Robinson's statue. A life is not important except and the impact it has on other lives. I want to thank Carl and Betty and Jackie and Jimmy and Johnny and Ned for the impact that they have had on our lives. We also want to thank our friend Mary Wall, documentarian of the movie The Fan Connection, for her introduction to Ted Green. This was a truly special interview. And a reminder to us how it is that we really go forth and make the changes that we want to see in this world. So welcome, Ted Green. Hello, Ted. Hi, guys. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm doing okay. Just went to a a stone unveiling, um, which always puts you in a bit of a somber mood. but, But let's put that behind us and look forward to the rest of the day. I don't know what a stone unveiling is. Well, it's a tombstone unveiling. The husband of the subject of my previous documentary, which was on Eva Kaur, a Holocaust survivor. Her husband was also a Holocaust survivor. He passed away last summer, but they did the really neat uh, stone unveiling today over in Terre Haute, which is an hour and a half from me. But that's, uh, you know, got that out of the way. And uh, I appreciate being here with you too. Appreciate you being here to, Your, as well. The stories you tell. We watched that documentary. That documentary is so powerful. Oh, the one on Eva? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Boy, that, that was, I mean, I had no idea of the history there at all. Next thing I know, there I am in Auschwitz, you know, walking around by myself because we go in before the crowds can get there. And we spent two years on that project traveling with her all over Europe. 
And then we spent two years pushing the education program we built about her and her messages. And it was what an experience. You know, I, I'm very fortunate to be in these situations. Can you give the name of that documentary too for our listeners? Uh, yes, it was it's Eva colon A-7063. Eva A-7063, because that was her tattoo number from her stay at Auschwitz. It's such a powerful documentary. And you wouldn't know what she went through, but then coming, you know, to America and the challenges that she found here. Yeah, I mean, she, she, she had 50 years of hatred in her heart. And she finally got to a place, I believe, where she, she kickstarted this, this grand hunt for Joseph Mengele. It didn't end the way she wanted it to end. And then her sister died the next year. And Eva was just, I think she was at rock bottom and her anger was on the verge of destroying her. And she came to a place where she could forgive. It's very controversial, but, and I can say this, I tell this people all the time, does it work? I say, you know, that's a very personal thing, but I can tell you it sure worked for her. It turned her life around. And in so doing, she was able to turn a lot of other people's lives around. I mean, I got to sit across from teenagers who would t tell me through tears that they were on the verge of taking their own lives. And then they learned of Eva and, and, and went to take a, took a pilgrimage and met her and how not only are did they not decide to take their lives, but now they are dedicating their lives in one way or another to helping others. I mean, I think that was the power of that incredible, incredible little woman, Eva Kaur. To then watch this documentary. Yeah, man, your projects are so poignant. <laughs> I have to tell you, like, I, I'm not a baseball um, per, I think Stephen really enjoyed, like, for, first of all, I, I think I know well, we're we live just, in we're LA jumping, and I'm a huge we live in Dodgers LA fan. And so. We're kind of jumping all over the place, but um, cause so I should, we should let you introduce yourself first before we dive into the, the documentary. So tell a little bit about yourself. My name is Ted Green. I am uh, now based in Indianapolis. I've been here for 20 years. I was a career newspaper journalist, uh, mostly in sports departments uh, at several papers around the country. And then kind of on a, on a lark, I decided in 2010, there's an LA connection for you. I decided to, John Wooden, who was born in Indiana and spent his first 30 some years here, he had just turned 99. And I thought, you know, let's do something special if he turns a hundred or in the event, you know, sadly he, he doesn't make it. I was like, well, you know, usually we just do a long story and maybe a photo gallery, but I'm like, eh. It doesn't seem like enough in this case. I thought, how hard could a, a five minute video be? You know, I'll, I'll string together some, some maudlin music and some narration, which I recorded in the boiler room and, you know, interview a few people. Well, I, I got so into it and I got so into that form of storytelling after 20 years of, of doing it, you know, in print that um, the five minute turned into 30 minutes, uh, newspaper unhappy because they're like, what do we do with a 30 minutes? You know, we don't do this. And not to mention, you don't have a sponsor. I'm like, oh, I, I didn't even understand the world of sponsors at that point. I sure do now. But anyways, I cold called it up the street to the PBS affiliate here in Indianapolis. And lo and behold, they, they liked it. They saw potential. We had to redo a lot of it because it was pretty rudimentary. But, and that ended up playing just across the country, certainly not because of me or because I was just new at that point. But John Wood, you know, he has that name and that, just that quality of a human being. And so, again, that was kind of a lark. And then I got involved in another short documentary about uh, military veterans. And then on the, basically on the strength of that, uh, my wife and I talked about it. She's also in newspapers. Newspapers weren't doing so hot, still aren't. Um, but we decided, you know, maybe this would be a good time for me to, me to make a, a change, or otherwise known as a midlife crisis. And so anyways, uh, I've done several films since. This, this one on Carl Erskine is my eighth film. And I was thinking about this. I don't like to compare films um, because they're all very, very, you know, very different. And you never want to hurt any, you know, family's feelings or anything like that. But I do believe that this film, this was the statement I've been sort of subconsciously working toward. And it took Carl and Betty Erskine to, to get me there. And I, I said it once, I'll say it a million times, that the two years spent on this project have been the best two years of education of my life. One thing that I felt after watching this is that it's a reminder that we are all connected. Our, our choices, our actions, our words, for good or bad, they, we affect each other. 
and how it unfolds like this this story like Carl and and his life every I mean it's an incredible story well there's so much to everyone's there's, life but this story is we were watching it so going much, how did Ted break get, get all, this all down to just the, an hour and 15 minutes or whatever you what's know, on so. the cutting room floor I mean it's I mean it's there's so his life is so much and it's so much goodness and we don't hear those stories very often we don't hear the stories of what if you were just kind what if you were just a good human and that is this story and going against all the odds and not in a bold statement just this is what I do and this is who yeah, I am. Yeah, just live your life. What if that was it? Mm-hmm. That the, And that is the power because in the moment it was so powerful and impactful. But I can look at our life and our journey and I just want to say thank you to Carl and Betty because what they did influences our life so much. And this story, your story, shined such a, a bright light on so many questions I've had on this journey. Like I've always, I've always questioned like, where do we get this? Th- where did, where did this foundation come? Where did this thing that they feed us when our child is born? Where did that come from? And I had a sneaking suspicion, but your documentary, it's, it's right there. Yeah. It's no holds barred as well. It like really gets down to the meat of things, especially when we talk about Down syndrome, just the history of things that people don't talk about as much about institutions and sterilization, all the stuff that we can go into, but it's just very in your face. And I know that's what a documentary does, but you did it in such a great way, even for someone that is so personally involved in the story, that facet of Carl's life, I didn't shy away from it. You know, it was like, well, we need to hear this stuff. Carl's life is like, five documentaries in in one i mean he's got so many different aspects <laughs> right um but you did such a great way of pulling it all together because there are such similarities in his life as he went through and showed his idea of race relations and then an acceptance and his idea into acceptance of his son it's with just Down who syndrome. he is it's mm-hmm. just who he is yeah I, I do believe that he is the perfect first of all thank you you're saying very kind things i believe that carl is the perfect embodiment of what is on jackie robinson's tombstone which is that a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. And, and Lori, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You kind of captured it well, kind of the, the why of the thing as far as why I decided to do it. I mean, I, I do, like with Eva Core and like with the films before that, I like to celebrate the triumph of the human spirit. And to be honest, after Eva, you know, I wasn't sure where I was going to go. You know, you don't want to go downhill. You, you know, you want to keep uh, pushing up. But then, you know, I, I learned about Carl and I, I poked around you know, I do a lot of research and, and, but it was what I think really drew me to him, you know, this day and age, you know, it's just so full of uh, vitriol and and, and bloviation and and politics getting on the TV, both sides of the aisle and just lying through their teeth. And it's just such discord. There just seems to be in my 55 years, this is, we're, we're sort of at a low point in this country in terms of how people just can basically get along. And and I think it was that that made me, I was just drawn to this old guy up in Anderson, Indiana, you know, of all places, who moved social mountains through grace, through humility, through servant leadership, through just being a good, decent human being, which which doesn't mean it was easy. No, it makes it all the harder. But He's one of those guys that speaks quietly, but speaks thunderously because it's quiet. And I think that's what, I mean, to me, there's a great book that came out a few years ago uh, um, called uh, The Overstory. It won the Pulitzer Prize maybe five years ago. There's a line in that book that says, the best argument in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. Well, I believe Carl Erskine's story and Betty Erskine's story and Jimmy Erskine's story, I believe that is the kind of story that can open minds, change minds, and just cause you to look at people in a warmer way. Again, this was, I didn't know when I started, but I think this is what I've been trying to say now for 12 years through all my films, but it kind of crystallized in, in, in this story. And, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just blessed beyond words that they, they trusted me to do it. I mean, it's not easy. Being the subject of one of my documentaries is a, a test of one's patience, uh, for sure. But, um, you know, I've been, I hear from him every day. 
you know, I'm, I'm really close with the family. And, um, you know, right now we're, we're going through some stuff here health wise. And they are just the first ones every day to call and say, hey, we're with you. You know, we're thinking about you. I mean, that's just you get fortunate to find the good souls once in a while in this world. And I'll treasure I'll treasure this, you know, my friendship with the Erskins forever. I can only imagine what the last two years, I mean, just watching the video of his story yeah. and, and listening to him talk, you just, I, I mean, what a gift, what a gift. What Carl does and what you captured was that Carl just honestly lives his life. It comes across fearlessly, but I, I'm assuming there is some anxiety when you're doing things this big. But, you know, when you talk about changing people's minds, we all know that we should love everyone. You know, we all know that we should include everyone in these hashtag inclusion and, and, and stuff like that. But we're products of, our, of, of how we were raised a lot of times. I think that people that continue on in, in a way of looking at people with disability in a certain light or people of another color in a certain light, they can change. But the first step of that is being aware what the right thing to do is, to really be aware. And Carl does it in a way where he's just a beautiful human being that you want to be like. So if he's doing things like this, then, okay, where are the changes coming to me? Now, there's the effort then for society. There's an effort of, I need to change myself. And it's not easy. It's like you, your outlook on people becomes automatic. You need to change that and feel comfortable with people that you didn't feel comfortable with before. And it does take effort. It's not like a, a just a snap of the finger and people can be like, all of a sudden, I'm just accepting But it can be. But it, it can be. It can be, but it takes effort. And I think what really makes it powerful is the way you've presented Carl as just a beautiful human that you want to be like. When you say it like that, I just have this memory of sitting across from Branch Ricky III, one of the last interviews I did, and he's funny because he sounds and, and he talks just like his grandfather, his famous grandfather, but I was interviewing him and then when I closed the film with that sort of long soliloquy by him, I was just listening to him and all I could think of was this is the end of the film because this captures Carl's essence, you know, the Erskine kind of hero, um, you know, in the selfless kind of hero. And uh, at the very end, his last line is, uh, people are proud to say, yeah, yeah, I know him. I know him. I mean, that's Carl. It's not, it's not an over the top kind of celebration. It's just, wow, look at, this is the best of what we, I think, as a, as a, in humankind, can be and and a lot of us me very much included have, have have slipped you know like another line in the film he's not there to to preach at you he's not there to scold you he's not there to shame you he's there to show you he he's there to light a path going forward and i guess that's i hadn't thought of it this way before but i guess that's kind of my hope for this film is this this film channeling carl might be able to light a path that that a lot of us can can improve from following you capture and and we'll get into there's so much <laughs> I feel like this is kind of what you looked at when you were like, how am I going to tell this story? There's so much to Carl's story. But I think that yes, that's what you captured is this is the best. And it's not like Carl never went out and said this is the best we can be Carl just was it and you saw his story. And you're showing people like this. These are things that people say, oh, I can't do it. Like I, this is how do we do that? How do we c become inclusive? How do we love everybody? How, how am I supposed to do that? This is how you just do it. This is how you do it because he just did it. And, and there's this beautiful, first of all, the story is huge. I mean, what a life. He played alongside Jackie Robinson, the change that he made in the fabric of our life. And that's Carl is one of those stitches. He's one of those threads. But you don't, I never heard of this thread. I mean, I know some people have, but I haven't because that's not what he was. He wasn't, the light wasn't shined. He was just doing it. And when, and when Jackie Robinson thanked him for going over and, you know, talking to his wife and child in the stands and Carl was just like, well, it was just what he did. As natural to me as breathing. Is what he said. That's what it should be for all of us. We can all breathe. We all breathe. Yeah. We just choose what breath we take. So you took this life and that, you know, I would say a handful of people know Carl and get to experience Carl on a daily basis. I mean, how many people, the people in his neighborhood, his friend, the people who have played with him that may have, you know, most of them have gone on, but it's like you're sharing and people get to experience him. And what a gift. What a beautiful life that we get to 
witness. I mean, I witness the life of my children and I'm, I'm, it's a gift. I get to witness Carl's life and it's a gift and it's a gift for society. And it also takes away a lot of society's excuses. And I think it's a beautiful reminder of who we are and who we can be. Like, this is who we can be. Well, and I tell you, that's why what I'm so thrilled about, it doesn't get the, doesn't get the headlines that the film gets, but I've worked with a partner with Special Olympics Indiana on an education, a curriculum um, that we're calling EPIC, the Erskine Personal Impact Curriculum. And we have, it basically consists of a shortened version of the film, which is, you know, a, a little bit sanitized for the younger viewers. Um, but not totally, you know, you need to see how bad things were to get an appreciation of how far they've come. But it also consists of, we've created three age level books, basically based off of, you know, of, of Carl's story. And we're offering these for free to every school, K through 12, so far just in Indiana, but we've get, taken orders from other states as well. And we've already taken orders for more than 70,000 books. And so, first of all, you're right, even in Indiana, you go out on the street, 95 out of 100 people won't know who Carl Erskine is, you know, so I think that's all the more important. He's always because he's always been celebrating others. He's always been lifting up others. Well, it's here is time to celebrate him. But here also, I mean, you know, Carl's he's 95. Betty is 94. In three days, they celebrate their 75th wedding anniversary, which is which is a pretty darn cool thing. But we want to we created this epic program so that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, hopefully, you know, that it will, it's really gaining traction that, you know, people will still be learning about him and learning his lessons and little lesson plans of how to be more accepting of others, how to see the best in others. Again, some of this stuff might seem kind of trite, but when it's packaged in a story like Carl's, it, it tends to take on a little more gravitas. And, and I'll, I'll say this about that too. I mean, I have, for years with some experience of, of my own in the field of intellectual disability from you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to tell a story. You know, I wanted to tell a story about Down syndrome. I wanted to tell, but I, I just couldn't find the right way in. I think if I made, this is probably a bad thing, but it is, it's, it's sad, but it's true. If I made the whole film about that, well, then that would be my audience. You guys would be my audience, right? And and there are a lot of people, but but it's it's a fairly limited audience. My hope was with Carl's story, and you know the baseball will bring a lot more people in. Jackie Robinson will bring a lot more people in. Um, but then you know they they're brought in, and then they learn stuff they've never learned before. Stuff I'd never learned before. You know the the history of how far we've come, where we were earlier, and the bad reasons why we were there. You know, and, and to, you know, it, and then the fact that it took, you know, what created this the mammoth change that has, it wasn't a ton of money. You know, it wasn't a, a politician to all of a sudden, okay, yes, we're going to do this and let's start a whole next. No, it was parents. It was grassroots and it started so small. And, and to look back, I mean, I couldn't include all this stuff in the film, but I tried to do some of it in the early 60s. You know, Carl and Betty would, they, they would host bake sales or, or Tootsie Roll sales, the potluck dinners. You know, if they raised a couple thousand dollars, it was a huge deal. So you look at that and you say, well, that's drop in the bucket, right? Drop in the bucket. Drops in buckets can add up over 50, 60 years. And I think that that's, you know, I mean, you know, Carl is so humble. You know, he keeps saying, you know, he's very, he was nervous about this whole thing, right? As opposed to Eva Kaur, who we called Eva the Diva. You know, she loved having stuff about her. Carl is very, was very reticent about being in the spotlight, but I think he decided to go for it because he thought maybe it could help others right along the line. And that's what he says about the epic curriculum. He says, the film is good. He likes the film a lot, you know, but like I say, people might watch it two or three times, hopefully, but the epic education program, if we can put it in there, right, that can, that can live on for generations and, you know, I think that's what this world needs right now, you know, a little bit, a little bit more of that. So I'm doing everything I can to, you know, get the word out about this amazing family. Well, I want to get um, links or how people can get those books for their schools. Sure. I want to go ahead and get some books for my kids' schools to put them in. We actually have an inclusive school that my, my son goes to now that's a beautiful model 
um, it's called Citizens of the World. And I thought, gosh, isn't that what we need to be, Citizens of the World? And I'd love to get those books in there for them to, because as I was watching it, I was like, how do we have schools watch this? Yeah. This documentary. I want, when you said c- kindness, it could be trite. I thought, gosh, what kind of society have we become when ki- kindness <laughs> But you do that, like someone's kind and you get like, mm, why, what do you want? But it's what, where, where have we come to when kindness is, is not just an aspiration? Well, I mean, like a major theater, a major film company would not have touched this story. They would have thought it was too boring. They would have thought, where's the skeleton in the closet? Where's, you know, you know, we, we need more, we need more angst. We need more conflict. I don't think we always need that. You know, I think that every once in a while, I understand what they're saying. They want viewership and all that, but let's not be afraid to celebrate the, the, the best among us. You know, let's not be afraid to throw them out there and say, no, he's not the best among us because he's the richest among us or the, you know, the best among us because he's the greatest athlete. No, he's the best among us because he's the best person. And, and these are what I like to say about, about Carl is, you know, there are a million heroes out there, sports heroes, et cetera, et cetera. But Carl's heroism is the best kind of heroism because it is an attainable heroism. We all have it in us, right? We all can do it. Again, what he does is he is lighting unintentionally. I mean, it's not like he set out to do this, but he has lit a beautiful path. And maybe we aren't all good enough to, to be able to follow that path, but I think we can all try a little harder and just and just look at people and just be a little more understanding a little more patient and and understand try to see i mean i think the big thing carl is he looks for the best in others he looks for them what does this person have to offer and i think that's what he did with with subconsciously with johnny with jackie and certainly with jimmy you know you gotta understand too i mean it's not like it was just about jimmy i mean carl went all out i mean he was there he was that volunteer um, at Special Olympics of Madison County, a small county here in Indiana. And that was, he got his hands in there. You know, he was there the whole time and he did it for 50 years. Boy, I'm sorry, I, I, I lose my train of thought. I get really passionate about what he is teaching, what he taught me, you know, and what he can, what he can teach others. And I just, I hope that this film, I guess at the end of the day, can, can help people. Um, see the best in their own selves and also see the best in others. Well, I think it will. I mean, you've, you've mentioned a wonderful facet of it where coming from our community, what a great way to spread the message that you wanted to give about Down syndrome by wrapping it around a lot of other great things. I mean, that's, that's a pretty great way of... It's inclusion, isn't it? Of, yeah, inclusively getting out all those great things that Carl did and things that he helped to change in his life. You did mention also some experiences you had as a as a younger as a child or a younger person that may have connected you to this project as well in the Down syndrome community or in the special needs community. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, it's a that's a tough one for me. I uh, I commend you because uh, nobody seems to ask me that question. Um, when I was a kid growing up, my best friend next door named Ned. We were best buddies, so we, you know, from the time we were two, you know, on. But it came out, you know, you don't think about it at the time, but Ned clearly had an intellectual disability. Uh, and to the point where, I mean, I'll never forget this as long as I live in, in first grade. You know, I was, I was fortunate to be born one of the smarter people in the class. Well, Ned was unfortunate not to be. And at one point, the teacher, this is hard to imagine now, but this would have been 1972, 73. A teacher had him put a, wear a sign around him that said, I am stupid. Oh, my goodness. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? I can't tell you the fantasies I've had in recent years um, of trying to find that teacher. But I, 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 I don't. But um, my beautiful friend, Ned, and I, there's some guilt I have here too, because as we got into high school and my life started, you know, I, I did pretty well, I guess, in high school. And I, I had new friends and I was off with girlfriends and this and that. And, you know, we just drifted apart a little bit. But, you know, I would see him and I would stand up for him if I saw, but I'd see him getting picked on by others in high school. Well, my beautiful friend, Ned, took his own life. 
And I've always felt, you know, in addition to just tremendous coring sadness, I've always felt some guilt because I, and people tell me I shouldn't and I get why they say that, but I could have done better. If I had been wiser, if I had been more empathetic, if I had just been less about me, um, I could have made him a little happier. Um, I didn't. And, you know, something I have to live with. But um, that's something that it's, it has stayed with me. And I think, that, honestly, I think that is what drove me to want to tell a, a story about, about people with intellectual disabilities. And, um, but in telling the story, so I had all these emotions, but I didn't have knowledge. I didn't understand. So I went back and I looked at the history as, as you see in the film. And as you see, we, people might, there are, there's a part of the film that probably is six, seven minutes long when Carl isn't even mentioned. People are like, what are you doing with that? Well, I'm laying the groundwork for when he and Betty had their child, April 1st, 1st, 1960. And that was to look at, again, what things were like, how they devolved, I would say, for a long time and then slowly got better through the grassroots work of parents. So I'm a long, long answer there. I'm sorry, that's kind of an, it is an emotional thing for me, but um, it, it's, I'm not going to ever say it was a good thing, but it was, it was an important lesson for me to learn. My hope is that other people maybe can start learning the same lesson that I'm still learning today through the magic through the story of carl and betty and jimmy what was ned can we say ned's last name yeah my buddy ned chosey ned Great. chosey i, I just want to in. take a second to just honor ned mm -hmm. and his courage and his life and thank you for telling his story because all of our stories matter they do everyone you never have to apologize for your answer, because we're just we appreciate you opening up to, and and sharing that with us as to well. hear your story. So that's that's your and and um, when you're telling it and you're like, I know I should. People tell me not to feel guilty. If you would have been in an inclusive school with an inclusive classroom, where differences weren't made fun of, the people in the high school that made fun of your friend wouldn't have been doing that. It's because it wasn't inclusive. So what, as a, as a kid, what are you supposed, that's what you learn. That's what, well, literally I mean? so the teacher like is, is, is teaching that. What, and just so you know, that was in 1972. I have a friend that I just worked with who has dyslexia. And he said that when he was in school, like in the eighties, a teacher did the same thing to him. I want to know from you though, is you then went for six or so, for however many minutes, seven minutes, told the story of where that thinking came from. Cause idiot and moron, those were all Imbecile. medical terms. Yeah. And how did learning where the foundation of that thinking came from change how you felt about your experience? Because that's one of the things I love about this story is because we can see, like, what is it that we're just regurgitating? What is society, where does that come from? I think just opening the textbook and saying, this is where it comes from. That can make us go, oh, that's what I've been regurgitating? That's, that's where these words come from? These are the people that um, I'm emanating? Yeah, right. How did finding out where this foundation came from affect how you then felt about what your experience has been with Ned? Uh, boy, again, you guys have done this before. <laughs> um, those are, that's a, that's a really good question. And I don't know if, if I really drew that link until now. Um, but, but it was always there because when I say this was the greatest education of my life, it's not about learning baseball stats, right? But to learn how it came to be that there was this fear, this utter fear of people who are differently abled. And then to see, I mean, compulsory sterilization. You know, it's, it's not a good thing for your state to be cited by the Nazis in their defense at the Nuremberg trials. I think we can, I think everybody should be able to agree on that, but compulsory sterilization, it was nationwide. I mean, California had the most. And, uh, it affected me 
to my core. I mean, the Eva core story, you know, there I'm, here I am in Auschwitz and I, you know, I, I, I went into a, a gas chamber, which I, I never did again and never will again. I mean, that, that, of course, that affected me. But this was, this isn't a one-off, you know, this is, this is the way people have been treating people for decades, more than decades. And, and why? Because they couldn't keep up because, you know, it was, it was hurting the, the progress of society. I think that's bullshit. It wasn't hurting progress of society. In fact, it was setting it backward. It was because the humanity, humanity is what drives everything. And when you take a step back like that, just for some maybe short-term gain, well, now we can make more widgets. What are you really doing to yourself? What are, you, what are you carving out of yourself? What are you carving out of, of, in this case, the American society? You're carving the heart out of it, right? And that's where all things come from. I'm sorry, I'm going off on a going off on a bit of a rant here. But no, I think you're absolutely right because when you say that, you're carving the heart out of like like what you've done to. Because look at the fabric today. I mean, I think we could all use. I think we can see that the ramifications of what was done then. Yeah, you carved the heart out, and I think that we need to like really do some healing there and some what your um, documentary points out and what we talked about because we've watched. I've gone through it a couple times. Is that when one of the most malicious, hated people in history, one of the most evil people in history, got their idea from you. You need to rethink if this is the foundation. This is this was the good idea that you had. Yeah, right. Think about that. And I don't. I think like I think this is the conversation, and I think this is why I love this documentary because it's so beautiful, and it's about a beautiful man who lived a beautiful life and the life that we should all be living that is rooted in love and just effortless grace and kindness. And he made that change, but you tell the whole story, you tell the whole story. And that is, that is what I I think is so important because no one tells this part of the story. Nobody does. I've never, like, I've, I've often wondered the answers to these questions. And I took pictures along the way because I was like, these are documents that people were given. And what is mind blowing to me is they took intellectual disabilities and they said, these are the degenerates. These are the people that we fear. These are the people that will destroy our society and t- obliterated them from society in such a malicious, inhumane way. And that fear actually now in this day is dominance. And so that fear is at the root of dominance and still inhumane and uncivil treatment of individuals with disabilities. Well, you use the word inhumane and, and Ted, you also said humanity is what brings us. And I, and I get that some, some of me does want to go ahead, (laughs) does want to point out that humanity does include this negativity. You know, humanity, the worst part of us as humans is shown in this. Mm-hmm. It's and a choice, though. I it, think It's a choice, yeah. but I'm saying we're intelligent, quote unquote, <laughs> animals. So we choose to do things that maybe when it comes to survival isn't the, uh, if you're playing a video game, wouldn't be the way to go. But to do what's right does take sometimes a conscious effort to change. It's kind of what I said earlier. But... This negative part of humanity of scapegoating that we've done in this, sh- this project shows it. If it's race or if it's intellectual disability, it's how do some people make themselves feel better by putting other people down or saying the things that are wrong around me is because of these people. Now let's shun them and blame them. That is something that can easily be passed down generation to generation. And that's the chain that needed to be broken. And it's happening And part of it is Carl and the people around him. And it is still happening today. I mean, that's that line, uh, the the line of the narration, you know, the the descent from fear to blame to worse moved with terrifying speed. Well, that's what happened in Germany as well. You know, you, you play off people's fears and then you say, well, let's blame them for all of our problems. And then what do you do? Well, we go the step further. Let's just get rid of them. Right. I mean, that's that's what they were doing. They were they were trying basically trying to excise this group from society. 
Now, in other ways, you see that playing out all the time, peddling fear so we can blame, so we can feel a little bit better about ourselves. Well, what the hell is that? I, I do want to go back because I am the worst businessman and marketer in the history. <laughs> you gave, you teed up a way for me to put the website out there and I just ran off in another direction. So we'll I'm put gonna... everything in the show notes and we'll have every, if you want to say it right now, oh, yeah, go ahead. Let's, yeah, let's yeah. team, let's redeem up again up. real quick. Well, it's, it's very okay. easy. It's, you can, you can see the trailer for the film. You can learn about the Epic Education Program. You can see the cast. You see the screening schedule and we'll be doing the broadcast soon. It's all available at Carl Erskine film.com c-a-r-l-e-r-s-k-i-n-e-f-i-l-m.com i think this is why i love the documentary because it, it is carl was at the time the american dream he was the american dream at the time but my dream now because i'm looking at him for inclusion i'm looking at him for civil rights i'm looking at him for setting a precedence of just the connectiveness and love and kindness and grace that to me is the life dream that is my dream if i can wake up every morning and like you said the light doesn't shine on me it shines on the people around me that i can lift that is really if i've if i've lived my life lifting other people and putting some love in the world then I've done it right. And that's what he does. But at the time, he also was the American dream. And then he got to this point in his life where they had this message, which you talk about the message like that was fed to parents then because as parents now we go, how could they take your child? Well, a doctor who was supposed to know what they were talking about says, you're going to ruin the fabric of your family. Oh my god! We've done several episodes in trying to counter that idea. Because, because it it's is not overwhelmingly the, truth. It's, the it's opposite. So, um, I mean. Oh, 100%. And, but you can see where, and that's why we definitely pay care not to blame parents who chose to go that route because they were being, I would put the word out there, brainwashed about this. You know, I think that they, they, they went into it with, with the fear that these doctors were giving them. And, and, they, and they legitimately would look at their other kids and say, well, is Johnny going to be compromised if we bring Billy home? You know, you can see why people easily see why people made the decision they did. Yeah, I will say I'm I'm really touched that you picked up on the the dream angle there because that's something when you do a story, especially a story packed with this much information, you know, you you need a through line. You, you need a, a course that's going to grind. You can't just say, well, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. So I tried, and it just didn't come to me right away. And this is one of the reasons why I never start writing until I've researched at least a year and I research and interview people because I don't want to go in. And I've, I learned that the hard way. I don't want to go in thinking, okay, I know what the story is. It's going to be this. And then I'll, if pieces don't quite fit in, I kind of tuck them in and make them fit. No, you want the story out there. And, and the dream thing, I mean, again, the fact that really what started the mistreatment but, you know, it went from the U.S. going from an agrarian society where, you know, it was common to see people who were as a quote unquote feeble minded. But then once the, you know, the American dream of manufacturing and, and you know, the industrial age, that's when these problems started. And then also, you know, Carl growing up, you know, his dream, the dream was baseball. This is he was going to be a sports star and and all that. And then I was what I liked is pointing out at the beginning of part three that really it was the American dream that put them in the predicament they were in, in that, you know, all the mistreatment out there, all the fear that, that is nonsense. And then to finally bring it around with that real dream um, is, you know, is that the Jackie Robinson's tombstone, the, the impact you have on other people. That is the goal. That is Carl's dream. That is who Carl is, not just Carl. Carl gets too many headlines. Betty Erskine deserves every bit as many, I have to say. But that that was sort of my through line. And, and, I, and I don't know how many people pick, on that, pick up on that, but I'm glad that you did. It, it, was, it also reflected my own evolution in, in thinking, is, is to realize that, you know, all that stuff that you, you, you're born to, you want to strive to do this and strive to be the best and strive to make the most money and, and, and all that, yeah, but what, how hollow is that? How hollow is so much of that compared to just, just getting along with people, treating them right? We, we have that in us. 
but I think we've 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 turned away from that a little bit. I'm generalizing here, but but just look what our kids are getting fed on. You know, if any kid has to watch the news, look at the top eight stories every newscast. Right, all the blaming, all the fear, all the hatred of people who are look different or act different. You can't tell me that doesn't infect and has not infected generations, right? So it's, it's not gonna be easy to turn that around. And I'm no, you know, I, 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 I don't kid myself that it will ever be fully turned around. But if enough people out there, again, if there's a, you know, it can be a groundswell of people pushing hard against the tide, amazing things can happen. And I think that that's what Carl and Betty embody and I'm hoping that others will think, you know what, maybe I can't be as, as great as they are, but maybe I can be a little better than I have been. You know? So glad you reminded us to keep mentioning Betty because there are so many things we loved about, uh, things she said that we loved in the documentary. One that Lori and I were talking about was when she'd have Jimmy out and, and, and walking around town or something, someone would stare or say something or this and that. And we've, as parents, we've experienced that. And we have different ideas of responses or not responses or thinkings or interior anger and all this. And she was so eloquent and just looking at that person. And, and after they would say a comment, just saying, I'm glad it isn't you. In other words, because you would not know how to love this person enough. We do. And we're giving them all we got. Well, the thing about that sentence is we've heard so many times people say, oh, I'm so glad it's not me. Oh, God. Someone says that to you. You say, so am I. Yeah. Because I'm glad it's me. Right. Because first of all, I'm glad it's me because this is the most amazing thing over. But I'm also glad because this beautiful human that I know, you would squander this. You would squander this gift. And I want to say like for Betty, like just making that choice. And when you talked about guilt and everything. Yeah. In 1972, when Geraldo Rivero went into the institution and showed us videos of what they were, then we could all go, oh my gosh, don't do that. That's what they've been doing. But that's not what was given to the mothers back then. They weren't said, we're going to take your kid, but we're going to put them in like naked with no food and poop on the wall and, and treat them like they're nothing. They have no value because that's what we've decided their value is. That wasn't what was presented. So making that choice when she made it in 1960 was... The courage, the courage she showed. And you know what? This is the truth. Carl will say this fully. He was initially bewildered. You know, he wasn't, he hadn't, he wasn't processing right. He wasn't leaning toward it one way or the other, but he just, and it was, but he said it was Betty. Betty was truly the strength there. She didn't hesitate for a second. I've been carrying this kid for nine months. He's coming home with me. The courage behind that. And I do, I do think Betty kind of steals the show. I, uh, I've talked to several people afterward. I have a group of, of women friends somewhere and they said, after they watched the film, they said, you know what? We want to go to lunch with Betty. We can, we could learn a little bit from this, from this woman. She is, she is, she is the rock and the two of them together. I mean, again, 75 years of marriage, but here's a bigger number. I like you guys can relate to this. Jimmy Erskine in 1960 was expected to live at best until maybe his mid thirties. Well, a few months ago, Jimmy turned 62. He worked at Applebee's for 20 years and he was beloved there. In fact, Carl will, if you ask him, you ask friends of Carl, what do you think was the happiest day of his life? It wasn't that when he struck out Mickey Mantle four times or this, that, it was his son's first day at Applebee's. And Jimmy also competed in Special Olympics um, for 50 years. Those are the kind of numbers that matter. And I know that's not just a one-off, that's a trend. Well, then where do you think those extra years come from? They come from love. Right? They come from respect. They come from dignity. They come from just being treated like what you are, a, a wonderful human being. That's where those extra years come from. Yes, you can throw some medical stuff in there and this, that, and the other thing, but mostly it's from love. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really, really believe that. Again, man, just I didn't stumble upon this story, but it kind of feels like I did sometimes. And, and I, I just pinch myself because you know I, I'm learning along with everybody else. And I'm grateful for it. A point that shouldn't be missed is you saying that Carl was bewildered when Jimmy was born with Down syndrome, which is a wonderful way of saying what mostly all parents feel uh, at diagnosis. But it does bring a great link to how easily he was accepting 
of African Americans in his sport and in his life because of his early experience with a childhood friend. He was inclusive in his friends. And it shows how it was just, like he said, like breathing. That's how he lived his life. And then when it came to something that he was inexperienced on, like having a child with Down syndrome, obviously there was nobody with Down syndrome in his life when he was young. You could see how he needed a second, maybe, to get that breath, you know? And, but it's a good link to how an early inclusion can really make things work. And again, it's, it's a little hard just to, to use words to say this. Hopefully it comes across stronger in the film, but this is 1930s in Indiana. And I, I did a previous documentary about Christmas Attics High School, an all-black high school, in, in which I studied a lot the history of racism in this state. And, you know, this was the hotbed of the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan in the, in the 1920s. And while that the Klan was sort of short-lived, the, the racism was rampant in the 1930s. So every societal force is pushing Carl away from this guy, if not worse. Instead, he, he offers up a basketball, says, hey, in a back alley one day, and says, hey, you want to play? And that's the name of our first kid's book, by the way, for the elementary school is just want to play. It was, it was based on, on that. Um, Carl will say, you know, a lot of it's his parents. Let's say his parents had grown up among the one third of the state population that would, had not ties to Nazis. Well, Carl probably wouldn't have been acted that way with Johnny Wilson, you know, when he was 10 years old. Probably wouldn't have acted that way with Jackie Robinson. His parents had open minds. They were loving people, you know, that came right to Carl. And, and I don't know as much about Betty's parents, but I think it had to have been the same there. I mean, that's a big thing in the 1930s, what they did. And I just, it, again, it's sort of the evolution, what Carl calls in his book, the parallel. Obviously there are different challenges, way different challenges, but at, at root, it's people not being accepted because in one way or the other, they're different. And, you know, Carl showing how it, it, it's, it's his own personal evolution, too. But, uh, you know, I didn't make this film to make money and I, and I won't. <laughs> but um, the idea is for people to see it and feel it and walk out of there thinking again, you know what? I think I have a little more in me than maybe I've, I've tapped into before in terms of how I can make this a better place to live. Very fitting that this movie is coming out when it is. I mean, as a Dodgers fan, this is an incredible year for the Dodgers, 110 wins just yesterday. And also Charlie Steiner being a narrator in this in this film just really just brings together so many uh, so much of baseball. It's it's really great. And also the the times you have with Vin and talking about that old Dodger Yankee rivalry. I mean, even the Giants too. that New York rivalry that was so prominent then and showing all the challenges as a player he had as well. All the challenges that Dodger team had back then, too, just could not shake the Yankees for so long. And the perseverance of that team, which is instilled in Carl and instilled in Carl and Betty's life throughout now the 75 years. Well, I, 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 the reason I was looking down because I was scrolling through my text messages, I wanted to find the one from Charlie Steiner after he watched the, because when we, we recorded the narration, I just flew out there, went to a studio. He just re read his bits and, and, and we moved on. But when he finally saw it, he texted me, just wanted you to, to let you know, A, I watched the best we've got. Loved it and very proud to have been part of this project. And B, Bob Costas texted me last night, having just watched it and loved it very much too. This is the part I like. Maybe, just maybe, niceness and decency can win in the end. My love to Carl and Betty. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, Charlie was, when I had a chance to, I was wondering who I was going to get to narrate it, but then I saw Charlie on a doc about uh, a Brooklyn Dodgers doc and talking about he was a fan back then. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I can get him as a narrator, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do. And he was the, the sweetest guy in the world, did it for a song just because he liked the topic. And yes, I do, again, I hope that a lot of things will bring new audiences to the biggest message in the film, which is that simply put as inclusion, but of course, inclusion is just a word. This is the actuality of it is so much, is so much bigger and more beautiful. You know, it's getting some good traction and, you know, we start small, but we, 
We're very much hoping that look, broadcasts around Indiana have already started. We're screening it everywhere. And now we're working toward a national distribution platform starting in this, hopefully in the spring of 23. And that That's where more people can experience the, the film. Well, inclusion is that everybody's included. And I think that this is another example of you can't tell one story without the other. You're telling the whole story. And that's what's really beautiful because... This film, like you said, when we were when we were watching like the first like parts one and two, I was like, "Oh, you're enjoying this. You've got like a full sport. Like it's oh, me, yeah. It's baseball history. It's um, history of the game, but also the impact of these like of Jackie Robinson of these the, the what happened under the guise of a, of sports, which is is really what what Eunice Kennedy says. Like I saw the impact of sports, and we're telling the story. I mean, that's how a lot of, of parents will know that a lot of the therapies that we do. It's like we're going to find this activity, and then it's going to bring about this gift, right? So, well, that first and second part's pretty sports heavy, but it is not something that threw you, Lori. I mean, th- this no, is it was great. And 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 honestly, every time I tell wonderful sports stories to Lori, she understands how much it mimics life. It it it's, it's an emotional thing. There's so many sports stories that anyone learns from, anyone gets emotional about, or can relate to. I've heard this a lot. I've heard people say, I can't stand baseball, but I love that film. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to do a biopic. So it's not like I'm just going to skip over the baseball. Well, the baseball was, was a huge part of his life, but also with Jackie Robinson, it was able to reflect uh, the times. Um, you know, like as somebody put Jackie Robinson, and I believe this fully, he, he, in fact, Martin Luther King Jr. and Dr. Martin himself said this, without Jackie Robinson, I would never have been been able to do what I was able to do. And Jackie Robinson came seven years before Brown v. Board, you know, and then to see again, to see how much good Special Olympics was able to do, just to put this out there in a spotlight and put this out there in a big spotlight and said, hey, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. You know that that helped change things. You talk about courage. You know, look at what Eunice Kennedy Shriver did. I mean, that's, she embodies courage. She, she, was the, she was the strongest one. Well, what do I really know? I'm probably exaggerating here, but imagine having your dad effectively lobotomize your older sister and look what that drove her to do and look how many lives were improved. You can say what I think you were going to say, because I do think she was the strong. And you say it in the in the documentary that someone told her she was the one. She was the Kennedy who was going to make a difference. Yes, she was the one who changed the world. She's the one who changed the world. And she and and this is this is the thing, though, that I think about is that back then, what was the intellectual disability that her sister had? Oh, it would be defined and diagnosed right now. It would be defined and diagnosed and with a little bit of support. And it comes from, like your film shows, which I love, is that it's this industrial revolution where before the industrial revolution, for the most part, everyone was included. And if somebody was a little bit slower, they were just a little bit slower. That's the pace that they walked. That's the path they were on. But we were, we included, we just, like you do now, you see someone, you know who they are, you accept them. And then that's what makes it all so wonderful is everybody's different. Then came the Industrial Revolution. And it was this message that was sent out, feeble minded or slow. And so I I, oft, I wonder when I hear those stories, what was it? What was it? And that's what is so profoundly disturbing, and so sad, you know, and she opened it like people looked at the Kennedys, isn't that Camelot? And she opened the closet door and said, my dad, Joe Kennedy wouldn't let anybody. What does that do to a human? What did they, what did they make their, his daughter? What did he make his daughter that's institutionalized feel about herself? That nobody came to visit her. And that it's the lack of love. Love is what makes a difference in this life. If we can love each other, if we lift each other, and just as equal to having someone's brain cut out is to have their heart cut out. And, and honestly, you changed our mind on Special Olympics. And Again, by showing the history of how, how it started, how it started was camps and a rich millionaire soybean guy saw not somebody with a disability, not somebody with an intellectual disability, just plain old kids crying because they didn't make it on a baseball team. And he said, oh, that's really Let's sad. And you know what? That is really sad because <laughs> not everybody plays professional baseball. And he saw that, oh, well, maybe I can make a difference in these kids' lives, neurotypical kids' lives. And he made this whole baseball thing with 
Carl Erskine and Jackie Robinson. Yeah, I mean, that was, I loved that part of the story. Uh, it, how cool. That's that's a part that really resonates with people. And and honestly, that league is still going strong 60 years later. And it was boys at first. I think the first couple of years, it was just boys. But quickly, I mean, this is way ahead of its time. Um, in, the, in the mid 60s, they included girls as well. And right from the very beginning, you can that video I show was from their very first year had kids with disabilities out there. And, you know, and they and everybody talks about it. And, and Carl typically, you know, Carl wasn't just involved maybe that first year or the first couple of years. No, no, no. He was involved for 40 years in that program up until it got, you know, got to be a little much for him physically. But, you know, that's that's just the kind of guy he was. He was at the ground floor of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, which I know isn't for, isn't for everybody, but he believed in it. And he was the one who stayed involved the longest and made the most impact, according to their historian. This is just who he is. Steve, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You said that Carl... And this is in the film, Carl, Jackie Robinson said this. He said, I, I see life divided. You seem to see life connected. Well, I think he does. I think that's kind of the, the beauty and the secret. And somebody said it, the Dodgers historian, uh, Mark Langell, great guy. He said that in each case, from Johnny to Jackie to Jimmy, Carl set aside his own ego and maybe set aside some chances for him to elevate himself even higher in this, in service of people who who needed a little extra help to feel included, you know, he he gave of himself, he lifted others. A lifetime of lifting others. Is there a better achievement than that? I don't know that there is, and um, that's what he embodies. And boy, you guys, I have to say, you're making me think of my own film in some different ways here. So I uh, I I do appreciate that, but I just feel we wanted to bottle his story and capture it for posterity while we could. And, you know, this was a difficult film to do because he was in his 90s when we were doing it. But fortunately, we were able to get those interviews done. And now that can his legacy and his teachings and his inclusive messaging can live on, you know, both through the film and through the Epic Education Program. Well, I want to hug Betty and Carl. <laughs> I do. I, I love yeah. them. I love them. Yeah. Um, they were doing the power of inclusion. They were doing things when people said you couldn't and you shouldn't, and they did it without asking. And they didn't just bring him home. They didn't just bring him home. They brought Jimmy everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And, you know, if, if he was acting up or had a problem, they'd do what they do with any kid. Okay, maybe we have to take you out of the room for a couple of minutes to calm you down. Then you're going to come back and you're going to be better. And uh, my gosh, I mean, that's... Uh, that is when, like, the ARC people here in Indiana, they just went on and on and on about that, how they were the family that made it okay. That, you know, said, listen, if the, if the Erskins are out there doing it, look at them. Well, you know what? We can do that with our child, too. The part in the story where you see the most pride, he'd hate that word, but the most pride in, in Carl's face was when his son Jimmy got onto that school bus for the first time and he and Betty are, are walking home, you know, just emotional as could be. And to see neighbors, Jimmy was 12 years old. Neighbors had been watching the Erskins raise Jimmy. They didn't do that for 12 years. And they saw this, they anticipated it. They were out there, not just by chance on their porches and their front stoops. They saw this moment coming. And for them to cheer those guys on, um, wow, what, I mean, I think that's probably the most beautiful moment in the film, at least as, as far as I'm concerned. And you can just see it in his eyes. He's got a 12-year-old's wonder in those 95-year-old's eyes. And you see it, especially when he's talking about the joy that he and the whole family have gotten from Jimmy. Well, I think every parent in this community and every parent whose child has been not included in something can understand that. Because I remember the day we dropped Liam off from school to school. And it wouldn't have happened if without Carl and Betty. And, you know, there's a couple times we go back to the dream where it says Carl was living the dream. And it says it a couple times, you know, because playing baseball, that was the dream. He got to live his dream. Most of the time, we think that dreams are unattainable. You know, a lot of times with the Down syndrome community, most people will be like, you know, they're angels and they love so differently. Uh, it's just as if it's unattainable. And one thing we always say is they just love without agenda. My son loves without agenda. He doesn't want anything from you when he loves you. And I just see similarities with Carl and my son. 
you know, so Carl did live the dream because he found the key. And I always say, you know, I look at Liam and I go, and I think I can do that. I have to always be reminded what is so special about him. I have the power to tap into that kind of love. And that's what Carl did. He, he did, he lived the dream because his love is without agenda. It's just what he does. I, I love without agenda. I hadn't heard that before. And I think that's beautiful. Uh, and I think it's, it's spot on, you know, that, that, yeah, we can do it. We can do it. You know, it's not easy. It's going to be very hard at times, but it's worth it. And look what it does. And to the extent that this film can reflect Carl in that regard, you know, I'm, I'm nothing but grateful to have been in a, in a, a tremendous position. I feel very, very lucky um, that I got to tell this man's and his family story. And well, we, we feel so fortunate to be thank able you to so much. also witness this story. And we thank you for telling it. And we thank Carl and Betty and Jimmy and the whole family for living it and to be that light and remind us what is the best of us. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much, Ted. Oh, you guys, thank you. I found this thoroughly enjoyable, moving. I mean, boy, you got me talking about my friend Ned and I never do that, um, but it's good for me. It's good for me. Let's, let's get it all out there. That's the, the best way to do it. And so for you guys to you know have interest in this and, and to give the film and me this platform, I'm really, truly grateful. Please follow us on Twitter at If We Knew Then Pod, and you can drop us a line on our Facebook page at If We Knew Then Pod, or visit our website, If We Knew Then .com, to send us an email with questions and comments. And you can join our mailing list there and get alerts of future podcast episodes. All these links will be added to this episode's show notes. Thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of If We Knew Then. From the top.